When I moved out to San Francisco, I started writing fiction, right? those tales of the city you've always heard about. Uh, and eventually, I got my first book deal to get published. The problem is, it's very difficult to launch a book. In part, because if you're pitching a nonfiction book, say you have a great memoir, you can go on TV and say, hey, this is my story, and I'm going to tell it. But if you're pitching a novel, the story is kind of always the same. Yeah, I made that up. Yeah, I made that up, too. So you don't get a lot of media coverage when you launch a novel. So I became the first person to launch a novel using YouTube. And there were a few things I learned right away. Part of it was because I had the inside track because this one worked there. First of all, you need to be short. It's like two minutes, three minutes max if you expect to get traction. Number two, it needs to be all of your original material. Otherwise, it's going to be taken down. You can't you know, to steal and use somebody's music that you don't have copyright to or images, so you got to come up with your own. The third thing I learned was something that I came up with, was the first version of the promotion for the book. We did, I had a professional photographer, an HD camera, and it was very nice, it was beautifully done, and it was all wrong. Because in YouTube, it's a one-on-one -on -one communication. It's not a stage, it's not a theater, it's not a broadcast uh, in, in, to an audience. It's communication with an individual one-on-one. -on -one. So if I wanted the viewers to believe that this was this you know, writer guy telling you about his book, I had to, to take those production values and I had to scale them way down. And so what you're going to see is one of my videos, he did a series of four, they're kind of documentary-ish. Uh, the first, like I said, the first version had a professional photographer. When I decided to do these, I actually got somebody who had no video experience at all, which you will see. <laughs> and and uh, included jump edits. It's all very deliberate, all very calculated to seem like it's just this guy who has his story to tell. You can take a look. Everyone thinks they know San Francisco. We've got the Golden Gate Bridge, the cable cars, and those colorful old Victorians. But there's another side of San Francisco. Selma. When you come to Selma, you don't always know what you're looking at. There's no guarantee there's going to be a big sign on the outside telling you what's really going on on the inside. Take, for example, the building behind me. That's 1015 Folsom Street. During the day, it's not much to look at, but at night, it becomes one of the hottest nightclubs in all of San Francisco. And then there's this address, 74 Otis Street. As you can see, it's fairly nondescript. There's no big sign telling you what's really happening here. Insiders know it's home to a club called the Power Exchange. And it's not like any other club you've seen in the world. It's kind of like a theme park for adults only. Inside the Power Exchange, you'll find a world where people come to act out their most intimate fantasies in front of other people. It's a massive place, 40,000 square feet. As you wander through, you'll find dozens of little areas designed to represent situations where lovers might meet. Some are classic settings, like something from a romance novel, such as a king's castle or an ancient Egyptian tomb. There's even a gothic twist, like this room, that looks like a mad scientist's laboratory. People come to the power exchange as couples or as singles looking to meet someone new. The choices and fantasy situations represent the entire spectrum. In the novel Soma, one of the characters is brought here to the power exchange. He's shown all this, and then he's forced to make a choice. What he decides changes his life. Would you choose one of these fantasies? Maybe the power exchange is a lot like people. From the outside, you can't always tell what's going on on the inside. What do you think about that? I'd like to hear from you. And thanks for tuning in. So for my next book, I've written a, a, a book called The Sower, and it's a, it's a modern-day parable set here in San Francisco. So for this book, um, I actually got an offer from a New York, a New York publisher, and it fell apart over a contract uh, issue. At about the same time, some kids, and I do mean kids, from a company called Scrib contacted me because of the first book, and because I was in online, they figured, well, here's a guy who's not afraid of using new media. And they said, how do you feel about launching a book with us? Well, I didn't even know what Scrib was. I'd never heard of it. Scrib has 60 million unique users per month. 
And I bet many of you haven't heard of it because it's mostly college kids that use it. They exchange term papers, <laughs> research, uh, that, you know, they, they become a real thing in their world. And basically, the kids at Scrib, which are about 25, 25 year olds here in San Francisco, they said, well, you know what? We want to do a store. And so we need a book to sell. We're going to sell ebooks in our store. We need a book to sell. So we wonder if you have a book that you'd like to be the first one to sell on Scrib. So I actually said to them, well, I think it's kind of a crappy store to have one book if you're going to open a store. So I got a couple of other friends who I knew had books that might experiment this way. And sure enough, in May of this year, we became the first book sold on Scrib. <clears throat> so basically, this is an ebook venture. And people can download the books through Scrib, and they can uh, run them on their Kindles, on their iPhones, on their laptops. It's actually pretty cool to use. So when we did this launch with Scrib, and we were the first, we got a lot of media. We were in the New York Times, the LA Times, the London Times, National Public Radio. What are these authors doing experimenting with this ebook thing? Next thing you know, all three of us are offered book deals by publishers who wanted to get the books in print. Uh, the, the turnaround time is done very quickly between when I signed the contract to, to, for the hardcover to the day it was in the store was 29 days. The usual turnaround time for a book is two years from contract to store. So uh, instantly it became a bestseller. Because again, in, in the world of publishing, you don't need millions of fans. You need thousands of fans in order to, to make your uh, splash. So I do this thing called scribbling. So I scribble, <coughs> say tonight, I'm going to be at this event. That went out to all 17,000 people. So over here you see that I have about 12,000 reads. Online, I sell the book for only $2. Why did I do that? First of all, most people don't understand how the book business works. In the book business, if any of you are thinking of becoming authors, I'll just, here's a caution. Uh, a typical deal for a, a book the author gets 7.5% of the cover price. So the first book, Soma, as a trade paperback, uh, costs $15, so I make about $1.12. With Scribd, I get 80% of the cover price. So I thought, well, you know, I could charge $2 for this and still make more per book than I was making with my one that I sold in New York. This is what got a lot of attention. This is what actually got us into the media cycle. And I still sell it for only $2 because I'm reaching out to a different generation here. I'm reaching out to college students. I'm trying to price this book as what they would pay for an iPhone app or maybe a little bit more than, a, than an iTunes. So I'm trying to reach out to their market. And right on here, if you scroll down, you can actually see that they, if you want it in hardcover, you just click right there and it brings you right to Amazon and you buy it. On Amazon, it costs $23.95. Or that's the cover price for the hardcover. So reaching out to all different uh, uh, age groups and markets in order to make that happen. And people are able to comment and, and the whole thing in review. That's how I did those two books, and I'll be happy to answer questions for you later. Thank you. Wow.